at the multi-service complex. Today is a great day in the city of Miramar. We're here holding our Affordable Health Care Act Forum for our residents and the surrounding neighborhoods to come in and hear more about what is required. Uh, this health care, known as Obamacare, is actually the law now. It's the law of the land, and there's certain things that are going to be required of each one of us to be informed so we can make that decision to avoid any penalties that are coming to effect next year. And so this health care forum here in our historic east side is critical uh, to make sure our folks are prepared. I have a lot of speakers here as I'm hosting this event today. Along with me, I invited our state representative, Chevron Jones, who was here earlier, <coughs> and a lot of our uh, business folks who are in the business of helping to make sure that our residents are aware of what is required with the Health Care Act. With me today was uh, one of the young ladies from the Gehring Group, and she spoke well about the, the insurances that are going to be available in the marketplace. We have other uh, vendors here from uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield and others who are here to explain <coughs> how to sign up in the marketplace. In addition, we have Enroll, Amer <coughs> excuse me, Enroll America that is here with us today. So we have a gamut of folks that are here to educate our residents, helping them to be prepared, because January 1 is when this is going to take effect, and the enrollment period is going on currently. We want to make sure that folks avoid the penalties and they're not caught up with all different kinds of schemes that are going to be out there saying that they're part of the Affordable Care Act. So we've got to be very, very careful. And the only we can, thing we can do is to educate ourselves on the process. This is one of two events that I will be hosting. I will host another one in our most western section to make sure that all of our residents have the information they need to make uh, an informed decision with regards to their health care and the health care of their family members. So if you have not been able to join me today at the multi-service complex, you will also be able to join me at our Sunset Lakes Community Center with a, when the date's going to be announced, the future date <coughs> will be announced for you. So again, be informed, be aware that it is the law, affordable health care is here, and we will need to learn what it takes to abide by this law. And we're talking about uh, the well-being and the livelihood and making sure people are uh, well. Uh, that, that is not a Democrat and Republican issue. That is an issue of making sure that the people we serve are taken care of because that's why they voted us into office, to take care of them and to represent them. <clears throat> the legislature did not expand Medicaid. Uh, uh, my Republican brothers and sisters did not expand Medicaid because they did not see the need to give in you the money that you have paid to Washington, D.C. They sent that money back to Washington. So therefore, the state of Florida did not accept those dollars. So what does that mean? That means those people who really need the dollars, who really need the health insurance, it will not go into full effect as the, uh, the United Federal Government has rolled it out for us to be. In Tallahassee, during that entire time, our goal was to make sure that the people are covered and to make sure that we expand Medicaid and give you the money that you sent to D.C., making sure that you get your money's worth. That did not happen in Tallahassee. What the Garing Group does is we manage and work with employers, predominantly public sector, um, but also private sector employers, and specifically with the health care reform um, or what we call the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, is to make sure that they stay compliant. Basically, the three main goals were to be able to make coverage affordable for everybody, to make insurance coverage comprehensive, because we had in the marketplace things called mini-med plans that were catastrophic coverages that didn't meet what you'll see in health care reform as minimum values and to make it accessible and expand coverage. Number one priority in there was to make things available to those with prior health conditions and or lower incomes so that we could touch that uninsured population that no matter how we tried to do it, through employer-sponsored programs, Medicare and Medicaid, we just could not get to. Let's talk about how we're gonna make it affordable. Well, the number one idea was to decrease insurance costs. As a market, we've tried through network discounts and Medicare and Medicaid uh, payments to providers 
to contain the cost year over year and offset the inflation of what a procedure would cost today versus what it would be a year from now. So what we've done within the health care reform is there is a formal rate review process. Now there is a rate review process in the state of Florida, but this now takes on a more broad approach so that if a carrier wants to apply for an increase to the state that they operate in of 10% or more, they have to file all the documentation to support why they do it. So the government will now step in and take a review for those carriers that want to come in and just increase costs with the idea that they want to try to gain a little bit more profitability. With that said, there is also in process with Medicare and Medicaid and also in the private industry where our employers buy insurance or where we as employers buy insurance, there is a revision in the way that we structure these provider networks and how we compensate them. In the past, if I went to a doctor, whatever they did for me, I, they got paid. And they really had no risk in the game. The other thing is if I went to a primary care doctor, say a general practitioner, an internist, and they screened me and said, you now need to go to a cardiologist, there was a great opportunity for duplication of testing and or no place to share the data of what one doctor did and the prescriptions and the treatment pattern that they had me on versus the one that he sent me to when I got out of the scope of what type of treatment he was giving. So we have new payment systems and new organizations called accountable care organizations that are being baked into carrier networks, but more importantly, are already in place in Medicare and Medicaid, and they're called primary care medical homes. Meaning, I have a group of physicians that will talk and interact with the care that I'm gonna receive and share data so that I can have a better outcome as a patient and not run from one to the other with conflicting direction and duplication of testing. So again, better outcome for me as the patient, but ultimately try to contain the cost so I'm not having needless testing over and over and I'm also running a risk with one provider treating me one way and the other at the other. Okay, medical loss ratio. Is anybody in the audience covered by a plan through their employer? Have you received a premium holiday or a check back? The medical loss ratio built in healthcare reform states that for large groups and for small groups and also for those of us covered by an individual plan, that my carrier that insures me has to pay at least 85 or 80% of the premium they collect from all their insureds back out in claims, in the cost of health care. If they collect more than they're paying out in this ratio, they have to pay the members back. If they get a little too top heavy in the administration portion, they're going to have to pay that back because they want them to put the money in and cover us for our expenses. If I'm a carrier, every year I have to file to the government and I have to report in how much I took in in premium versus how much I paid out in services, claims. If I exceed those guidelines, I then have to take a prorated share of the premium I collected over and pay it back out. Okay? So if I'm on an employer-sponsored plan, they're going to pay the employer, and then the employer has to use the formula to either provide a cash refund or provide a premium reduction or holiday back to you. If I have my own insurance that I purchase outside of my any employer coverage, or maybe I'm just self-employed, or my employer doesn't afford me coverage, if that carrier collects too much, they are due to issue a payment back to you and or a premium holiday. 
but you are technically in the open enrollment period, which is the time that you can check out what's available, make your elections, and apply for coverage through the marketplace. You must cover yourself and any dependents with essential coverage. Okay? These are minimum standards that in order for a carrier to offer benefits in the marketplace, whether it be a federal or a state offering, they must meet. It also increased the insurance pool. They're trying to attract the healthy, and I'll explain that to you a little bit later. They want to get to those younger people. I mean, when I was 20, I thought I was immortal. What did I need insurance for? I was going to be healthy forever. But the reality is that we do need some type of coverage, and we do have this mandate that now will hold us accountable to that. Again, this was challenged in the Supreme Court. Our state was one of the leading states to take this to the Supreme Court to say that it was possibly not legislatively able to be done. The Supreme Court came back and said that it is upheld because it is not a mandate as far as mandating us as individuals, but it is a taxation if I do not comply. And that's where, if we do not secure coverage in one of those four areas, employer, Medicaid, Medicare, on my own or through the marketplace, I will be subject to a penalty in the form of a taxation. And for non-compliance, you'll see starting in 2014, it will be $95 per person. So if I have a family of four that goes uninsured, I will have four times that penalty. And it will gradually increase as I file my taxes at the end of every year to be, by 2016, projected just under $700 a person a year. Okay? So we need to look to that marketplace or that employer plan and say, what am I paying versus my penalty? What am I getting in benefits? and what works best for me. What happens when we try to make coverage comprehensive? Well, we want to make it stronger. And again, I come from the perspective of employer plans, working with employers to make sure that the programs that they offer are compliant. But within the marketplace, they need to do the same thing. And if I have a carrier that offers individual coverage outside any of those venues, they need to do the same. So what were some of the first steps well, when the legislation came out in 2010, one of the first things that we all saw was that any pre-existing condition limitation was lifted for our children up to the age of 19. Because one of the reasons that was documented for uninsured population that I referred to prior was, I had an illness, nobody would cover me. Okay? So the first thing they went after, immediately after passing the legislation, was to lift that barrier for children up to 19. As we go into 2014, especially because of the marketplace being launched January 1, it is going to be lifted on all policies. What that means is the programs cannot, if they still have it, hold back coverage because you had a pre-existing condition. Okay? So we're all on the same playing field now which is kind of good, because for you as a consumer, you get to look at an employer plan, you get to look at an individual plan, you get to look at the marketplace, and during open enrollments, move around when your circumstances may or may not change, or the offerings are modified. Essential health benefits, I'm gonna show you a slide in a little bit. There are essential health benefits that in the legislation, if you're going to offer coverage that is acceptable, you must have these benefits covered. Elimination of lifetime and annual maximums. Again, one of the very first things that happened was, in our world, in employer-sponsored programs, and, and now moving forward in the marketplace and individuals, there is no lifetime maximum on a plan. So if I had a catastrophic illness, and I had a $2 million maximum, and I happened to be the member that needed that coverage, that cut me off at that level, 
right out the gate, they lifted the lifetime maximum and invited you back to those programs. Preventative services, this is big. 100% coverage for those coverages deemed required. They must be offered at 100% with no payment from you by those programs. They also put in the legislation enhancements for employers offering wellness initiatives to allow an incentive, a financial incentive for those members that are covered under our plans that make wise decisions and take good personal care of their health. Okay, right now legislation allows an employer to incentivize you to make wise choices and take care of your health by a differential of 20%. With, Janu with 2014, that's going to go to 30% and they can incentivize you or decentivize you with a financial incentive for non-tobacco use up to 40%. So the healthcare reform has this huge push as we have in the industry for preventative but it allows programs now to be innovative and to really put some skin in the game for you that if you do take good care of yourself, you'll be rewarded for that. Women's Wellness Initiative, this is again, I'm going to show you a slide. This is initiatives around wellness, counseling, and areas that we needed. This is a requirement if you're a non-grandfathered plan, and it is required that you cover them at 100%. And then now, as we go into 2014, non-grandfathered plans will be mandated to um, recognize coverage for some clinical trials. Here is a snapshot of what an essential health benefit is. You'll see that it is required in order to participate in the exchange, which is now called the marketplace. It also is required of any employer-sponsored program must include 10 categories of expense and I'm happy to say that our employer sponsored programs all tested out and already had these in there and it must include some habilitative and pediatric dental and vision so again adding to those programs and making them more comprehensive and it applies to programs in 2014 and 2015. This is a copy with some of the key areas required by health care reform under the Women's Wellness Initiative for non-grandfathered plans. And you'll see that there's breastfeeding, support and counseling, contraception, okay, domestic and interpersonal violence counseling, screening and counseling, gestational diabetes, HIV, DNA, and we go on and on. Okay, so again, some of these were not covered in plans traditionally offered by employers. Some of them were because in Florida, we did have state legislation that drove the requirement to cover annual exams, <coughs> mammograms at certain ages. So this again enhanced the scope of coverages that you now had when you were you're afforded a health program that is compliant within health care reform. Make it comprehensive was one of the first things they did was say on a federal level and then the IRS allowed it for pre-tax deductions. We expanded the area of eligibility under an employer health plan. Instead of just covering children to 25, we were covering them now to 26. We had internal and external processes for our claims. When we incurred an expense and it got a denial, now we have a whole legislative set of requirements beyond what we had where the final level of review could not be somebody or conducted by somebody who had financial risk in the game. So we had a very good outside perspective. Reporting of health care coverages on W-2s. This was around the beginning of reporting on our W-2 forms, the total value of health care coverage so that the government could in fact maintain whether that employer would eventually pass the affordability testing in their offering. Copays, the, the, the uh, video we watched going into 2014, typically in a health insurance program that we offer as employers, the copays that we pay are outside 
the maximum that cap that we have called an out-of-pocket maximum. Going into 2014, they will be included. So it's very clear what our worst case scenario is, and we don't have copays that we pay in addition. That includes your pharmacy copays. And then notification requirements. If you are employed, no matter what status you have, you should have already received your notice of your availability to purchase insurance through the marketplace. It was due to be distributed to you no later than October 1st. And that is whether I'm a full-time employee eligible for coverage, part-time, seasonal, or variable employee. And again, any changes that your employer may make in their plan off the normal anniversary or open enrollment period, you must be notified 60 days in advance of that change to implement. Okay, here's a copy of a summary plan description. One of the things that the legislation required uh, starting last year was that we all use a consistent format of notifying you of benefits. This form should have been distributed to you if your employer offered you coverage last year, and it will be a requirement every year. And it will allow you to take this form from that plan and put it along any other plan option you may have a, a, that you're eligible to help you as consumers easily evaluate which is the best offering for you. This year, if you got one last year, you're gonna, it's now modified. And there are declarations that your employer must say about the plans they're offering you. One is, does it provide that minimum essential coverage? because that is a requirement to be able to satisfy some of the penalties and avoid some of the penalties. And does it meet the minimum standard, the value? The overall value of the benefit, does it meet the minimum that healthcare reform requires? Because the lowest option plan in the marketplace is that value. That copper plan is that value. If we were uninsured, or uninsurable for six months, the government had a temporary high risk pool that we could apply for and get coverage for. Those of us that had medical conditions that either raised the premium so high that we could not afford it, or we became unemployed and couldn't afford COBRA, or that we had a medical condition that nobody would write us insurance. This was a temporary high risk pool that was initiated right away to provide coverage to us until the marketplace launched. This went into effect in 2010, and it goes away on December 31st of 2013. That would be at the end of this year, because you now will be the first population, if you're in this pool, to be eligible for enrollment in the marketplace. Okay? The role of the marketplace, again, we are participating in the first year in the federal level exchange and marketplace. The states were given the opportunity to establish their own marketplace. We were part of the challenge in the Supreme Court justice, so we helped. By the time that everything came down, it was a little late to try to get a full-blown marketplace up and do it the right way, so our governor opted into the federal offering. So when you participate and you go to the website for the state of Florida, you will be participating in the overall federal exchange. What is the role of the marketplace? Well, small employers under 50 lives will be able to purchase and offer coverage through this marketplace. Now their open enrollment was initially going to be 10-1, but the hub and the feedback the government elected to defer it to November 1. November 1 was yesterday. It is not um, up, and obviously with the individual hub, they are working on that. So they've delayed it again to December 1, but employers will offer benefits if I'm less than 50 employees in that marketplace or out of the marketplace on their own. It's open to us as individuals. There are four levels, basically four levels of coverage. They're, they're called the mental plans or the levels of generosity. They start with the bronze, they go to silver, gold, and platinum. And each one is richer. 
So if I'm at the bronze level, I am buying coverage that actuarially will cover me for up to 60% of my expenses. Okay, so overall there's a calculation. This also, this bronze level is the minimum value that any employer plan has to provide to be able to be um, compliant with health care reform and not face potential penalties. The only place to use the eligible subsidies and or tax credits for those of us that are anywhere under 400% of the federal poverty level is in a government issued marketplace. So I either need to participate in a state or a federal marketplace if I am in that wage earning for my household and I want to receive a subsidy to the premiums that will be charged and or a tax credit at the end of the year. If you choose an employer plan or you choose a private exchange or a private individual plan outside these public exchanges, you're not eligible for the subsidy and the tax credit. And again, they must be qualified health plans and the pre-existing comes off. So the high risk pool that's sitting there just to hold people over to make sure that those of us that are ill and couldn't secure coverage are covered will go away and you will be eligible to go in the marketplace. There is again, behind us automatically offering coverage in an employer plan to children up to 26, the IRS came in and said, you can also do it eligible for pre-tax benefits. So they redefined the age limit of where we can no longer declare our dependents as pre-tax. The other thing is we operate in the state of Florida and there are some plans that in addition to that are governed by a state statute that says under specific conditions that employer plans must offer you the opportunity to continue to cover your children from 27 to 30. And when you go in as a new hire, the health care reform now limits the length of time that an employer must make you wait until you are offered coverage. And that is no more than 90 days. And that is specifically 90 days. Count them on a calendar, and it includes weekends. Fees to employer plans. What else should we consider? Well, making benefits richer is very good for those of us who use the program. But it also adds a challenge as an employer trying to maintain coverage levels. It's, it's balancing a budget and knowing that if I cover more, my premiums will go up because the carrier sets the premiums for what they anticipate in claims. In addition to that, this year, as we handled renewals in 2013 that overlapped January 2014, there are fees that we now have carriers building into the premiums in addition to what we normally face when we're um, contemplating renewal of health care. Okay? And the video actually talked about the last one, so I'm going to get to that on the next slide. The first one is the Patient-Centered Outcome Research Institute fee. We are an industry of acronyms, so we politely call this the PCORI fee. This is a fee that if I'm an employer and I offer benefits, I automatically am required to pay. And it helps to support a huge, uh, level, uh, very high level provider group in Washington, D.C. that will assess patient treatment plans and write what we call white paper to help keep physicians up to speed and to recommend patient patterns for care to have better outcomes and to eliminate repetitive testing and redundancy that we currently see in the market. Now, it's already been in place. We started paying this and it was assessed way back to 2012 and you'll see it increases year over year. It is not by any means the most expensive fee. It is very manageable in my opinion. Um, but it is something that they're doing and it will immediately pertain to how we're, our providers treat us in Medicare and Medicaid and then ultimately spill over to those plans in the marketplace and those that I oversee that are offered by employers. 
There's also a transitional reinsurance fee. Now this one's a little bit heftier, okay? And remember I told you about that high risk pool? Okay, that pre-existing pool, that coverage that was immediately put out there for those of us that were ill and had trouble getting coverage? Well, those claims statistically are going to be higher than those we typically see in an employer plan. So what they're doing is they're building fees or they're extending fees to employers in their programs that offer a coverage to be able to offset and collect funds within health care reform to offset when that population of ill people goes into the marketplace, okay? Because that will topple over a plan if you don't have some way to fund or counteract those higher claims until we can get people enrolled that are the healthier population, and I don't pick on anybody ill because I stand to be one of them, and when we're ill one year, we are not that ill person the next year, okay? So again, the idea is we want to provide coverage to people who have illnesses that are challenging and to make sure they can get coverage, but to get a healthy population in there too to offset the cost. So this fee is established to help offset it until they can attract that healthier population into the marketplace. Now this is a little more expensive. This is $63 in the first year per member per year. So I call this the belly button count, okay? If I'm an employer and I cover 200 employees, this doesn't count just my employees, it counts every single person enrolled in my plan. I will show you the, in the video they talked about a health insurer fee, that they were going to charge a fee to the health insurance companies to help provide financial support for the subsidies and the tax credits we are eligible for in the marketplace. What's happening is those fees to the insurer are being passed down to the employers through their premiums, okay? So you'll see that the fee is to assist in subsidizing those of us with lower income levels so we can get that insurance in the federal and state marketplace. The fee is ongoing. It has no projected end where the other ones do. And you'll see that in the first year, the goal is to collect $8 billion through these employer-sponsored plans to help us to buy insurance in the marketplace if we're not afforded coverage elsewhere. And you'll see each year, the fund will go up. And that makes sense because as this marketplace is up and running, the goal is to get more and more people into it. So therefore, they need more and more money to attract and get those subsidies going. What we're seeing, in addition to all other renewals and increases year over year in premium, that just this fee alone that's being passed down to employers is resulting anywhere from 1.6 to 3.5% low and more on the total premium. Now that's big, okay? And the way that this is, it depends on which carrier you're with, and it's a prorated share of how much membership they have in the overall market. And that includes Medicaid and Medicare coverages, okay? So if you have an employer plan and you're being educated that medical costs are going up and that's why your premiums year over year are going up, Please also know that in the back end, these fees all apply in January of 2014. So this is also driving some of the increase that's being provided. There is pay or play. There, these are the penalties. If an employer plan, and this is where we're digging in with employers ahead of time to make sure they're testing, they're making decisions that are compliant, and balancing the financial side of providing benefits, trying to make sure they're richer than they, you know, as rich as they can possibly be, and then also making sure that everybody can afford it. So, there's an employer shared responsibility provision in healthcare reform, and what it says is, and this, the video alluded to this, if I'm a full-time employee, I automatically get offered benefits by my employer. But now, healthcare reform dictates who's eligible for coverage. So you can call me part-time, 
You can call me seasonal. You can call me variable, where my schedule I don't know from year week to week. Okay? And in some conditions, you can call me a contract employer. I, I, as an employer, have to measure. And if you work on the average over my measurement period of 30 hours a week or 130 hours a month, you now are eligible for health insurance. Okay? That's good for those of us that have been excluded in the past because, again, it provides us something accessible coverage that we didn't have it before. However, if I'm an employer that has to meet minimum value and affordability, meaning I have to contribute a certain amount to that health insurance, it now adds the cost, adds to my cost of providing that benefit. So we always walk that line, okay? And it's applicable to employers with 50 or more employees. Now again, if I do not meet this criteria, if I measure and I, or I choose just not to offer you coverage, and I miss a set amount of people being offered outside my full-time population, I as an employer am subject to a penalty of $2,000 per person that should have, all total, should and did, be, were offered coverage, I will have to pay that penalty. That's a budget buster. That's huge. That is a big number. So if I'm an employer who says, I'm done with this insurance game, I have tried, I just can't do it anymore, I'm going to pay the penalty. They will pay $2,000 times every full-time employee by the new definition, a year. And that's what happens and that's the discussion, especially in the private industry and the small employers that are just trying to keep things afloat. They're saying, is it cheaper? You know, should I just say I'm not going to offer coverage and pay my penalty? Well, we all know why benefits, if, if you're as old as I am, uh, you remember why benefits were even offered to begin with. And that's so we can attract and retain, as employers, good employees. So we are trying to have that discussion with employers to say, you know what, it might be easier, maybe a little bit more expensive, but remember why we did this. Okay, and it was to help our employees to purchase insurance at a reasonable cost. Then there's the NUNAT adequacy penalty, that if I do not offer that minimum value coverage as an employer and or affordable coverage by the definition of health care reform, that I have a second penalty that I'm subject to. So if you own a business and you're not thinking about this, you definitely want to. Okay, next. Fees to employer plans. Just want to remind everybody that this is in the back end. As we fight every day as employers and employees to get our benefit package through our employer as strong as it can be, sometimes there's a cost associated with that. And a lot of people have managed the cost year over year by making good decisions as members using the plan and as employers stepping up. But in the back end of this legislation, come 2018, if things don't change as we move forward, and we're watching this very carefully, there is a 40% excise tax called the Cadillac tax. Okay? And that excise tax is not based on how rich my benefit package is. It's based on what my premium values are. So I could have a very weak plan that I'm offering that just barely meets the minimum requirements, but I might have a population that's sick two or three years in a row and my costs have escalated. So the evaluation of whether this tax currently as it stands is in my plan or not is based on what my premium values are, not what my plan looks like and how much I'm covering for my members. So we want to make sure that we keep this in mind as we're moving forward and I put the values up there. Those are annual premiums for single and for families. Okay? And again, we are pending guidance. This is in the way back. Right now we've got a lot going on for 2013, going into 2014. Exciting stuff. You know, they're trying to get to the values that I started this presentation with. There is some shifting of costs that employers, as they continue to try to offer you coverage and expand the breadth of who they offer coverage to, are battling with. 
especially if they were hit with the economy. But at the end of the day, everybody's in the same boat trying to do the right thing. And I just wanted to make sure in this presentation that you saw some of the value of what this legislation is trying to, to um, accomplish, what the employers that I work with are working on, and what the end result will be to you as the member. And if you click to the next slide. This is just a quick snapshot of where we are, where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. And as you can see, these are just a few of the things that we work with on a daily basis to make sure that our employer plans are compliant. And we've been very busy uh, trying to do the right thing and offer people uh, affordable coverage. I appreciate no one fell asleep. Woohoo! We're good. I know health insurance is not. Um, we've been funded um, to, uh, separately from HRSA um, to provide assistance enro with the enrollment and the, uh, with the application process and also the outreach portion um, when it comes to the Affordable Care Act. Uh, as, a, as a community health center, in which I'll go, I'll go a little further down, it's, it's going to be part of the marketplace too because we're a direct referral um, within a marketplace. We're one of the centers that we provide services to all ages and also to the insured, underinsured, and uninsured population. We also service the populations who are uh, undocumented or just have no access to health care. Uh, we've actually had, I've actually um, had the experience of sitting there completing an application uh, for an individual and it referred them, they weren't qualified for the marketplace, um, but it referred them to a, a, a community health center, which means that they'll be exempt from any penalty um, to do with the marketplace, so that $95 fee you saw, you know, or, or any other fees, they'll be exempt, but they're, they've been referred to a community health center, which, uh, which functions the same way um, with the federal, federal poverty guideline, where it's, uh, it's based on the household income, basically the same process. You'll be able to become a patient of the centers and receive um, services at the centers, just as somebody who has health insurance when it comes to the center. Um, but, um, you know, there are criteria to meet, and you'll go through the, through the entire process. Um, we partner with the major hospitals um, for your specialty care, but we provide primary health care at our centers. Uh, but having said that, I'll go along, I'll, I'll move on right into the marketplace. And what to expect uh, if you or, or an individual that you send or a relative goes to apply, I want, I want you to be prepared so that you don't go there and uh, make a blank trip. We don't want you to go unprepared. And all the news you've been hearing that, that, is, that, that it hasn't been working and that there's been a lot of delays and there's been a, all the frustration you've been hearing um, plays a, the, is a, the, a major part of that is because some people haven't really been prepared as well. So there's a, it's a two part process to it and that's why this is very important and we're thankful again for that, uh, that Vice Mayor Davis is doing this because it's important that you know what you're going into uh, when you go to apply, that you have the proper documentation, um, that you know what you're going there for so this information is very, very important, where to call, where to go. Um, some people, frankly, there are some people who call um, who ask us uh, if, um, who ask us if this uh, law is in effect already. Some people are thinking that it's going to be in effect in January. Uh, some people have no idea. Some people are really clueless as to what's going on with it. So all of this is very important and we all play a role. So you need to share this with your congregations, your neighbor, your relatives, anybody who can benefit from it. Now, having said that, I know you've seen this and you heard, uh, uh, you heard um, the basics of the, of the marketplace already. But, it, but essentially, it's just a new way to find health insurance. Now, it simplifies your search for coverage uh, by identifying plans that fit your health needs and budget. Notice that it says your health needs and budget. And the reason for that is, is that it's, it's a case-by-case -case basis and that none of our plans will be identical. Um, I may not qualify for the same things you qualify for. I may not have the same needs you have because our, whether it's age, household, um, household income, or, or the amount of family, or even area, area code. There are four things, practically, um, your, your, the area code, not area code, I'm sorry, your zip code, um, your age, uh, um, your household um, size, um, and also if you are a smoker. That's one of the things that we're, that, that uh, there's, you know, the, the pre, they're, they're, they're not, if you have a pre-existing condition, that's no longer a problem to get health insurance, but smoking is one of the questions that you will actually be asked on the ap actual application and that way, that may actually, um, that will determine 
you know, what you're eligible for as far as plans. Um, now with that said, um, in, the, in the application process, um, you're going to um, notice that uh, some people are going to go in and, and realize that, and I, I've actually had some scenarios where some people go in and they say, you may go in and be frustrated and say, well, you know what, I just applied and I'm not eligible. And sometimes what the people, what we find the people are doing is that they're either under-reporting or over-reporting, where some people will, will try, either they won't report all of their income, and, all, and if you file taxes, if you've ever filed taxes, all of your information is already on record. So sometimes that's going to delay the whole process. So something that could have taken, let's say, an hour to get through may end up taking you a few days to get responses. And then if you short some more information, it may take another another week or more. So that kind of delays the, the, the whole process. And people have been getting really frustrated. So those are some things to keep in mind while you're going to enroll. When you make that call, ask everything you need to, uh, you, you will need to bring with you. And, and, and tell us your, your situation, you basically, you know, whether it's where you live, um, uh, your immigration status, uh, your household side, income, and things of that nature, so that it can really expedite the process for you, and we can really, you know, decrease the level of frustration. As we know, you know, the website has been—it's been a challenge with the website, but we've been having a lot of success lately. To purchase coverage, uh, you know that you can be uh, uninsured and uh, or and or underinsured. Just because you're not eligible doesn't mean that the people in your household who you've uh, who you've uh, applied for will not be eligible. The only problem is that if you have any if you, uh, the only, only problem is that if you do miss, if you're missing any documentation in the process of enrollment, you may delay and affect their, pro their, um, their, their part because that your entire application has to be completed um, in order for everything, you know, in order for everything to be facilitated. Do we have any, uh, anyone in here who's not a citizen, if you don't mind just sharing, if that's okay with you, if it's not a, anyone, everybody here are citizens? Now, this is the interesting part with that is that um, more people, thank you, I'm from Haiti, so I, I, I can relate. But now, the, the, um, the interesting part with that is that you don't need to be a, um, a green card holder or, um, or, or just a citizen, citizen to be eligible in the marketplace. There are over 20 categories um, that if you're lawfully present, you can be um, eligible for the marketplace which means I mean, when some of the areas are temporary protective status, some are if you're a victim of trafficking, um, and, and many, other, many other documentation that will allow you to enroll into the marketplace as long as it has to be, it will be until uh, the expiration of that actual document, but you will be able to enroll into the marketplace. Now I just want to share this with you for another reason, and you've heard many of them. These are the, the approved plans, and um, the approved plans in the marketplace. And you've heard many, you heard a lot about this, that if you do not enroll into the marketplace and you do not go uh, via the marketplace, you won't be approved for the subsidy or tax credit, uh, the subsidy. Now, this is the, the challenge. And the importance of these uh, events and, 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 and opportunities is that um, if, you, if you don't, if you, uh, there are going to be some plans, some, or, uh, some, uh, some plans, some other plans, and not to be, we can't be biased as, as enrollment specialists, um, that we can't stir you towards any plan. It has to be your own choice. Now, the thing with that is, 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 is there are some people that refer to it as Obamacare. And the only reason we've been, uh, we've been telling people the marketplace is because uh, there are some plans. Some people have created new websites and all of these different things. And you, 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 uh, you may have seen some in the news where they say we're affiliated with Obamacare. And as you know, if you enroll into any health insurance plan, let's say you enroll today, um, you, you, you're locked in until, until it's out of the enrollment period or until the next enrollment period or, um, or unless there's like some major life-changing event. And so some people have been, we've actually, um, I've actually heard of some cases locally where somebody may go into a plan, they've been pulled in saying that, you know, promise that they'll be receiving subsidies, that is the same thing as the marketplace. And so they, they get pulled in and they roll into, into um, a health insurance plan and then they come back and they make a call to whether it's to any of these centers, the centers uh, or locations where they're doing enrollment into the marketplace, and tell them, hey, I'm waiting for my information. I didn't hear anything about the subsidy. I didn't hear anything about about. I didn't really see a list of like you know a list of options. But I'm already I'm enrolled into a plan. Now, if this happens, uh, this is some this is it's a lot of misinformation, and we're really that's why these uh, forms are very important to make sure you when you, you ask these questions when you're enrolling. 
And when somebody sits you down, we're not allowed to charge you to provide these services. And I'm not speaking for agents or brokers or anyone else involved in the process, but as certified application counselors or navigators, our job is to be non-biased and provide the information that we've been hired for, which is in regards to the marketplace. We can't steer you towards any health insurance plans. We have to share all of them with you and let you choose one that fits your, that fits your needs or budget. All of the plans, all four levels, I uh, have to uh, have to. Um, uh, they have to have the essential health benefits. Um, there's a fourth. There's a fifth one, which is the catastrophic um, health plan, and we'll go. That, that's a little later. Um, but with all four plans, whether it's the bronze, the silver, the gold, or the platinum, has to have the essential health benefits in order for it to even be a qualified health plan. If it's outside of the health insurance marketplace, it has to have uh, the essential health benefits in order for it to be an approved plan, so that you're not penalized. And, and, and just so that I can make it clear, I am not opposing or, or speaking against the other health insurance companies that's not in the marketplace. I'm just telling you that we are providing services for the ones that are in the marketplace. That's what we've been hired to do and that's what's involved within the marketplace. So if you do uh, enroll into another health insurance plan that's outside of the marketplace, uh, that, does not, uh, that does have the essential health benefits, um, you, may, you won't be penalized and it's fine. That, that's okay as long as it meets the criteria. You're okay with that. Now, you, now these are the four categories I've you seen and, you, and you, you've heard over and over. The bronze, the silver, the gold, and the platinum. Now, as you see that word in bold letters, be careful. Your choices can affect your monthly premium cost and, and what out-of-pocket costs you pay. The categories do not reflect the quality nor amount of care the plans provide. I won't mislead you to tell you that, um, that if you want to pay a lower premium, uh, just go ahead and, and, and pick the bronze. Because we don't all, like I said before, not all of us have the same needs. Uh, if you if you are frequent, um, if you have any type of illnesses or any condition that requires you to, to, to have a lot more visits to the um, to your primary care doctor or to a um, to um, uh, to a, hosp a hospitalization, you may want to choose something that will cover a little more because the bronze level uh, may be uh, uh, much cheaper. Your premium. Your monthly premium may be much cheaper, uh, but your out-of-pocket um, will be a little more with the Brunts package. And, and, and also, in order for you to receive the subsidy, you have to choose a silver or higher plan in order, in order to receive the subsidy. Now, if you are unemployed, you may qualify for Medicaid, um, uh, CHIP, the Children's Health Insurance Program, reduce rates for approved plans in the marketplace um, based on your income. Your options, again, do not depend on your employment status, only household side and income and an estimated income for 2014. Now while we're here, let me tell you about this part, is that the estimated income is a, uh, is a uh, gets a little tricky because what happens is some people feel that if they uh, report less money, uh, then they will be able to get a, um, a tax credit or a subsidy. And um, so they report, you know, if you, if you will, if you know and you willfully, um, put in the wrong, uh, the wrong uh, amount um, of what you expect to get next year, um, you, may be, uh, you may have to pay back that premium tax. They may, that may be that you may have to pay some of it or all of it, so that may be taken out of your, your, your tax return when you file again. The catastrophic health plan is for those who are 30 years and younger um, who choose to have this plan. It covers the actual essential health um, benefits. It has a very high deductible. Um, it provides a kind of safety net coverage in case you have an accident or a serious illness. But the 30 years and, um, and younger, it also actually uh, makes room for someone who may have an extreme illness or, or there are some other people who may, who may be um, eligible to, get to, 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 um, um, to, to choose the uh, catastrophic health plan. So there's, um, so there's a way, it's, it, we've actually, I read through this, actually experienced it that, that some people, some other people other than those who are 30 years or younger, who may be a little older, may be eligible for the catastrophic health plan as well. So when you sit down with your uh, enrollment specialist, navigator, um, or certified application counselor, or wherever, or going through it yourself, those options may be available as well. So don't think it's, don't think it, it, it's, it's out of the way, you're, um, you're, you're, not, um, you're not qualified automatically. If you don't have health insurance coverage in, in 2014, if you, can't, if, you cannot, if you can't afford it but don't have health insurance coverage, what happens? Now, we've had a lot of people that's come to us and, and they said to them, they, they've been saying, well, you know what, I'll just go ahead and take that $95 fee 
uh, because that's going to cost me a lot less um, than I would be paying monthly anyways. So they've done a little logic and say, you know what, that's what I'm going to do. Now the, the danger in that is, um, is if you have any, uh, if you have, if you're a member, if you have four members in your household, and you guys have uh, um, enrolled in, if you up to not enroll into the marketplace, as you saw earlier in the previous screen, you're going to be charged a penalty of $95 per person in the household. Now, if each of those people um, have a, an emergency um, or, or they use the hospitals within that time, that year, um, you're going to be responsible for the entire cost. Um, so if all four of you are, um, have an emergency, you, you're hospitalized, you're going to be uh, responsible for the entire cost. Now, the, the danger, again, in all of this is that uh, if, you, if you choose not to um, enroll within that time frame, uh, you have to wait, if, if March 31st comes here and you don't, uh, you don't enroll, you have to wait until next year, October again. So it's something to really keep in mind because you have, it will be almost an entire year until you're able to get in, in a health insurance plan again. And it's, it's frankly, uh, frankly, the purpose of this is to help, uh, you never know, it, it just being the fact that you enroll into the marketplace, uh, I, I would advise everybody to at least go in and try to enroll because some people may actually be, uh, be eligible for, uh, for whether it's Medicaid or they may actually, you may be exempt and they refer you to a community health center or another program. It's very important to enroll. We're focused specifically on outreach and education. We don't focus on Medicaid expansion. We don't do voter registration. We don't do small business health coverage. We are focused on the individual, and then the in-person assistance, we direct people to those that can help them. So, quick summary of the uninsured. 67% live in these 13 states. Uh, we have people on the ground in all of them except for California, because California has a state-run marketplace. So they have state-funded groups that are doing the same thing. Most of the states that we're in have governors that are hostile towards the Affordable Care Act. So it's very important that we're on the ground talking to people, making sure that they have the information. In November 2012, 78% of the uninsured did not know about new health care options. In August of 2013, that was down to 43%. However, that's still almost half of the uninsured that aren't aware that, you know, the marketplace is an option for them. So that's why we're here to, you know, Talk to as many people as possible, make sure that people know that this is an option, that, you know, a lot of people think that the Affordable Care Act is struck down or that it won't apply to them, but it does. Anybody can enroll in the marketplace. Next slide, please. And of those people, 69% are actually interested in learning about their options. So it's not that people don't care, it's just that the information hasn't been presented to them. We have four key messages, and one of these will be the top message that will resonate with 89% of the uninsured. So all insurance plans have to cover doctor's visits, hospitalizations, maternity care, emergency room care, prescription drugs, mental health, basic health coverage. There is the possibility to get financial assistance to help pay for an insurance plan. All insurance plans have to show the cost and what is covered in simple language with no, no fine print, and they're directly comparable and then if you have a pre-existing condition, insurance plans cannot deny you coverage. So we're kind of going to talk about what the coverage options are here in Florida, how much it'll cost, the process of enrollment, and then who the key players are. So there are three options available here in Florida. There's Medicaid, which has had no change in eligibility. There's the marketplace with financial assistance. And then there's the marketplace or a private plan without financial assistance. Those are all based upon income. So what you qualify for is based on your income and your household size. Next slide, please. So Medicaid, the federal government, sets the minimum requirements. Historically, low-income parents, children, pregnant women, low-income elderly, disabled individuals. Medicaid does not cover undocumented immigrants. And the ACA allowed states to expand their Medicaid programs. Not every state did. Florida did not. So there's been no change in eligibility for Medicaid here in Florida. Next slide. The marketplace. Uh, consumers are eligible to enroll if they're a US citizen or in the country legally, and if they're not incarcerated. Coverage includes the essential health benefits. Marketplace opened October 1st. Coverage may begin January 2014, January 1st. However, that depends upon your enrollment date. Again, as long as you enroll December 15th or earlier, your coverage will begin January 1st. You enroll, you know, December 17th, your coverage is going to begin February 1st, etc. So, 
Four key messages, once again, we're very big on these. Basic health coverage, financial health, simple language, pre-existing conditions must be covered. These are the four messages that will resonate with people. So you can enroll online, in person, by phone, or using a paper application. Now, it's a data-driven system, integrates eligibility across programs. First, you fill out some basic information about yourself and your household. So contact information and who's applying for coverage, income, different types of income, the number of people in the household, citizenship slash immigration status, and then if you have affordable coverage now. The process varies from state to state, but generally speaking, let's say we're applying online. So you enter that information, the system will then pull data, kind of match things like it'll match you know, your social security number, um, then it'll you know, show what it's pulled up. You can either change that, you know, correct it, add on, and the system will determine your eligibility. So the system will then funnel you either to Medicaid or CHIP if you are eligible for that, or it'll take you to the marketplace where you can look at the plans that you qualify for and choose. There's no wrong door. So it's a single application that is the same application whether it's online, by phone, or in person, paper, whatever. One application, system determines your eligibility, and it will enroll you. So let's say you fill out this application and you're eligible for Medicaid. You don't then have to fill out another application. It's one application, takes you through the whole process, the end. And at the end of the day, consumers choose. So consumers complete the application, if they're eligible for the marketplace, they compare their plans, choose one, enroll in it. Navigators and certified application counselors can provide unbiased assistance with the process. They're not getting paid to promote a specific program. Other groups can obviously, you know, help, but we tend to funnel people to the navigators and the certified application counselors because they are paid to give unbiased support. Like, they are not promoting a specific plan. And then at the end of the day, the consumer chooses which plan they want to go with. Um, when it comes to financial assistance, uh, your eligibility is based upon household and income. Um, household and income. So, um, generally speaking, if somebody lies within 100 to 400 percent of the federal poverty line, which is anyone that, as an individual, makes under forty-four thousand dollars, or as a family of four is bringing in under ninety-two thousand dollars, they will be eligible for some type of financial assistance. So, I mean, that's a fairly large gap of people that are going to, you know, be eligible for something. I thought the event was extremely um, informative um, and it was open that people could ask several questions. I thought they did an excellent job at the event. It was very good. I felt like my questions are answered and I'm walking around now trying to get some more information from the different groups. One thing that's great about the city of Miramar, they always put on things to inform you about things. So I love that. I love living here because it's great that they do that. It was very informative for me. It opened me, my understanding that um, what we hear is not always the absolute truth. They say, you know, there's three sides to the story. There's your side, his side, and then there's the truth. So this was very informative for me. And I have a better understanding. I don't feel so confused now to get online and go and apply for it myself. And I didn't know there was so much assistance out here to help us when we have questions or we think we don't qualify. So I really enjoyed it and I'm so glad I came. I'm a breast cancer survivor, so it's very important to me to have health insurance. And it's important to all of us, I mean, even if you don't have uh, illness. I'm happy to know that everyone qualifies, regardless to what your illness is, what you had in the past, and that's very important. The things that they're doing for the community here, um, I'm sorry I left. <laughs> but um, it's a great improvement and um, the city of Miramar is an example for other small cities to piggyback on and take a look at and say, hey, what can we do better?